Thank you for joining us for this week's Office Hours. We are doing some special content today. Uh, seller in the Spotlight, we're talking to Dylan Blackhorse Von Jess from Dragon Parlor Games. Uh, my name is Sean McNichol with the onboarding team. And I'm Monica with the Customer Success Management team. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Dylan, uh, whenever you're ready to join us, we're going to uh, get started. Sure, yeah, no, I'm Dylan. Um, my last name, as Sean mentioned, is heinously long and it's entire own story. Uh, but I uh, manage the TCG player backend for my store, Dragon Parlor Games. Nice. Right, cool. So we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about uh, what drew you to the industry. Certainly, yeah. So gaming's always been part of my life um, from a very young age. You know, uh, at like 10 years old, probably, I uh, had my first like independent experience of walking into a game store. Um, and starting to get into hobbies. Like this was a place where people didn't think I was a weirdo. I could be engaged with whatever I wanted to be. I took some like grandparents' birthday money, bought a 40K model off the wall. Um, and there began the next two decades of my life. Uh, I, I ended up working for a couple different game stores as, as I got older, um, eventually like, you know, got into magic, which I hadn't seen since I was a, a child at that time. Like when I was in my late teen years, Zendikar M10 was coming out, magic was reinventing itself at the time. And I hadn't seen a card since like Ice Age. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> um, but eventually that actually led to a career. Eventually, you know, I was in game stores long enough. Um, and, and now we're here. I have my own store with my partner and TCG player is a huge part of that. Awesome. Uh, so how long have you been selling on TCG player? Oh gosh, it goes back now, I suppose. Um, when I first started as a seller, I was doing one of the more niche things. There's, there's a whole lot that sellers do on TCG player. There's people who only sell the fringe games that can be hosted here. Um, there's some people that do case cracking. There's some people who are only doing like small in-store trades or trying to move a couple cards. At that time, oh, four or five years ago, I don't, I was cracking Pokemon sealed product and reselling it, um, which lost me money. Mm -hmm. But it learned, it taught me how to use the TCG player tools, which was the most important part of that experience. Um, knowing how to use the TCG player tools and the resources that are available to you on TCG player, even from the beginning as a level one seller, all of the help articles that are out there um, were incredibly invaluable. Uh, as I, as, as the years went by, eventually I ended up um, managing hard back end for other people. And, and now I run my own store. Um, and our principal focus here now is magic singles. We do what the marketplace does best. Um, and that's move, move magic cards, bringing them in and, and pushing them back out again. Interesting. So uh, just related to that, you know, you said that you started with um, cracking Pokemon boxes and uh, turning the singles over from there. Uh, now how you source your inventory, just basic singles. How do you, like what's a, I guess my main question is uh, difficult to word. <laughs> Uh, but sourcing your inventory, you know, um, I guess breaking boxes was kind of hard to make that margin. So um, where are you finding that now? Right. So in Pokemon, it's a weird market because common and uncommon cards have value, not for the card that they are, simply for bulk value. You send them off to some reseller that sells them to grandparents online in these bulk lots or whatever. That's an entire market all its own, which means that cracking Pokemon can sometimes be profitable. For Magic, that's just not the case. Mm -hmm. Every seller knows that when you get down to the commons and uncommons, who the value just oftentimes is, isn't there. And some sellers have had a lot of success on the platform through the direct program, especially selling thousands, tens of thousands of two to 15 cent commons and uncommons, and that's super, but it's not what we do. Um, what we do is we source cards, both from our local community. Uh, we have a retail storefront. We utilize Pro and the kiosk program, but our principal way of sourcing cards is the TCG player buy list program. Mm -hmm. um, we get 
the vast majority of our inventory online using the buy list program. Um, and it's an invaluable tool. I know a lot of sellers are kind of reluctant to try and use it. It's, it's scary when you're just offering an amount online items. Um, and when it starts becoming automated, if you don't have a really tight grasp on how those numbers can affect each other or what it, what target numbers it is you're pricing off of, um, it can, it can be scary to get started in that field. So, but it's, it's become probably the number one way we source cards. I mean, it is, I'd brand the numbers, but. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, so that kind of segues a little bit into um, some of the TCG player tools. So um, what sort of challenges have you run into with um, direct pro and buy list? And uh, can you talk a little bit about that? And Certainly. So, um, there's, there's obviously a progression. There's, a, there's steps that every seller goes through. Um, and some people stop at different steps and some people don't use, not every seller uses every uh, product that's available through TCG Player. Um, but when I was managing my first um, backend inventory, Direct was the first program that was incredibly exciting. That we, it, was, it was the first step after Seven Level 4. It was like, here's Direct and it's amazing. <laughs> um, but, as soon as you, as soon as you enroll in direct, like there's your welcome emails um, and everything are gonna tell you as a seller, hey, by the way, your volume's gonna go up. Um, <laughs> be prepared. And that was something that I, I wasn't prepared for. We thought we were, and then we weren't. Um, and the principal thing that led us to was sometimes when the way that you sell cards changes drastically, the in-store processes have to change. Um, we, um, long ago did not have our inventory condition sorted. Um, it was alphabetized. That was, I think the first variant was everything together alphabetized. Uh, and then it ended up being set sorted and alphabetized by set. And then eventually we were like, you know what? It just doesn't work. It just, if you're indirect and you're at a certain scale, you eventually you just go to condition sorted. You have every condition completely separate from each other. You have the sets sorted in TCG players catalog system order uh, and then alphabetized from there, um, which has its own struggles. If you are a store that has gotten to the size you are from sheer force of will on board games and miniatures, and this is something you're getting into now, like you already have a team of maybe five employees and you are struggling with the idea of training all of them on how to find cards when a Amon Ket card, for example, some random dollar rare could be found in nine different places, mm -hmm. um, depending on, you know, what's the condition? Is it foiled? Sure as heck hope it's not a pre-release card. <laughs> um, you know, if you're, if you, and you, you just have, you have to be able to train all your employees to be able to find every card in every situation and sometimes that seems daunting. I can promise it's totally worth it, depending on your scale. Um, if you've only got 500 cards, maybe 5,000 cards in inventory, maybe alphabetization still just works for you, or maybe alphabetizing by set still works for you. But at scale, eventually, you'll want your card sorted the exact same way TCG player sorts your cards, which comes back to buy list, honestly. Um, Anyone who's packed an RI for direct knows that your cards have to be in a very specific order. Mm -hmm. um, and if, you're, if your inventory is in that order, that's great. Um, and if that's the vast majority of cards you're moving out, it helps a lot. Um, and if it isn't, it's slower. I've done that. I've packed RIs when my inventory was not in that order. And I do not recommend it. Um, but even more so, what I don't recommend is if you start buying on TCG Player Buy List and your cards start coming in in that same order as well, at some point, you're going to break to the pressure. Um, and, and training your team properly to be able to, to work with that is, is, certainly, um, is certainly a challenge. But it's, it's definitely worth it. Um, it it's time-consuming and it's a risk, but that's business at its base. We take risks and we send people home with paychecks. That's what we're doing here. So um, 
It was a broader question, though. God, it feels like I've just gone on forever. But there was a broader question here. What were the other struggles? A lot of answers. We talked about, that question. We talked about yeah. my list. <laughs> um, we hit a lot of answers in that question, yeah. Oh, I see people that have problems a lot when they go into these new programs. Um, Pro, of course, is just fantastic. Um, having the in-store kiosk is a major boon to so many sellers. Um, it provides customers a way to shop just your inventory in store and from from home where they can just pick up the cards in store, which is really great. It's a fantastic product. Um, and then of course, buy list, which I've talked about enough already. But any of these programs, if you're a part of any of these programs, you have a CSM. Um, you're, you're assigned a customer success manager if you're enrolled in any of those programs. And oh my God, there is not a single better resource that I have ever seen anywhere from any other company that we work with than the CSM program. Um, our CSM is Eric, who many people on the forums have worked with. Yep. Phenomenal, phenomenal. To Fantastic, as is the rest of the CSM team that I, I see on the pro page all the time. Um, and we get quick responses, we get concise responses. If it's, hey, I don't know, I gotta talk to another team and I'll let you know. He says that and then he does, he gets back to me. If you mm -hmm. ever have any issue, any like, hey, I don't know how this works. Hey, I can't find this help article. Reach out to your CSMs, 100%. They are there to help. They want to make sure that you can sell successfully on the platform. That's, that's the goal here. We all wanna be successful sellers and TCG Player and everyone working there wants you to be a successful seller too. And if you don't know who your CSM is, feel free to email sales at tcgplayer.com and they'll let you know. Yes, absolutely. We definitely, uh, thank you Dylan for bringing that up too because uh, one of the reasons that we're even doing office hours and featuring uh, Dylan with our seller in the spotlight is just to continue to like pull back the veil and say, hey, you know, here we are. You can have conversations with us. We're here to help your business be successful because we're not successful without you being successful, you know. Yeah, uh, if anyone turned into Pro Labs that we had our previous session, 1.30 Eastern Daylight Time, you know, previewing uh, the mass price scheduler, it's just another example of us listening to your feedback so that we can give you what you need, you know? But, um, yeah. And it's, I'd, I'd actually, Sean, I'd love to jump in on that. Um, yes, too. Because TCG Player giving us what we need is I, I think a topic that we don't highlight enough, at least in a public forum. Sometimes I'll see a new feature and I'll just like shoot Eric message and be like, hey, I noticed this thing, tell product they're doing great work. Um, but a lot of times it, it doesn't get necessarily brought up in a public forum that like there's updates that happen like all the time. Um, if you've ever gone to your back end and something's just like slightly different, um, that's because something changed. It's because there was an update made. Someone was like, this is broken and it'd be nice if it was fixed. Or, hey, there's this like cosmetic thing that would just make my workflow easier. And TCG Player went in there, product team, real people. It's an actual team of people. I know I say TCG Player, but like there's human beings at keyboards back there. <laughs> um, took the, the feedback, saw the user stories, saw what they could do to improve the system for sellers so the sellers could be more successful and then took action. And that's been immeasurably awesome. Um, you know, it's, it's little things. It's like, I mean, it's, it's, it's big things, but it's little things all the time. Um, I'm sure many sellers noticed um, when on the pricing page, for those who use the pricing tab for a lot of their work, um, oh no, your video went down. Um, that use their pricing tab for your work, there was a, uh, an update made so that market automatically populates into your marketplace price column um, for cards that you've never had in inventory before, uh, which just means that there's less legwork to update. You can just move things to live as soon as you've got your stuff in stage and then worry about your pricing update after the fact. Okay, uh, we have a quick question from uh, Facebook chat. Does TCG Player Pro allow for other things like board games and 40K stuff yet? They're, they're utilizing Crystal Commerce at the moment because it allows for everything uh, in one spot. 
And uh, at the moment, we do not, unfortunately, have board games in the catalog. But please let us know what you'd like to see in the catalog. Mm -hmm. The more uh, feedback we have from sellers, um, the better we can create tools and form a catalog and just make it easier for you guys to use our tools and use it holistically for your whole store. That is the goal. So please be specific. Let us know. Um, contact your CSM. You can email sales at tcgplayer.com. Let us know mm -hmm. what you need to be able to run your store. Like if you need the 40K, if you need board games, which board games? Yeah, t-shirts. I mean, you know. Cheetos. Cheetos. Soda. Yeah. If you're into that kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, you right into uh, sales at TCG Player, um, pro support at tcgplayer.com, catalog at tcgplayer.com, because we need your feedback. So thank you. Um, so back to you, Dylan. And if there are any more questions, definitely throw them in the chat. Uh, keep them coming, all right? But uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask also, since you've been with TCG Player for a while, um, you know, the initial jump to online sales can be somewhat daunting for a lot of brick and mortar stores. So uh, what's your um, like experience jumping to online? Have you always done online or just in general, I guess? Where's that bridge? When I, when I first started with TCG Player, that was really my first experience selling cards. Mm -hmm. um, I, um, I never worked for a company or myself attempted to sell cards in a store without having an online presence. Um, that said, we did have a really interesting shift. Um, when I was managing for another company, um, they had originally been using Crystal Commerce. Um, which is an interesting platform. Um, and at a time, provided certain services that TCG Player wasn't providing in, in a broad sense. Um, and still today provides some features that some sellers prefer to have. Um, for example, extra market, um, ex external market integration into things like eBay and Amazon. It still provides those services, but, uh, we had severe issues with that platform um, as it pertained to online sales. Um, we would have serious critical technical glitches, things like orders voiding out of a system and refunding months after they'd been processed and delivered to customers. That went on for months, months and months and months and was never resolved from, from Crystal Commerce's end. Um, and there was a, no end to the weird ways that the, the tools that Crystal Commerce had for pricing cards on TCG Player's marketplace as a sync seller at that time um, look good in practice, but the data that they pull from is not necessarily always the data that you expect. Um, and how that data influences your pricing, I didn't have a clear concept of until after we came to Pro. Um, and when we came to Pro, it was mind boggling what happened. Um, firstly, our, our sales went through the roof. Um, moving from T from Crystal Commerce to TCG Player Pro had a major positive impact for us. And partially, I believe that that had to do with our ability to more accurately price our cards. Um, as many sellers know, um, TCG Player, the catalog, the inventory backend, there is a unique line item for every card name, set name, condition printing for every card. Um, like my example with the Amon Cot dollar, dollar Rare previously, we've got Near Mint, Light Play, Mod Play, Heavy Play, Damaged, and all of those in foil. And since it was a rare from Amon Cat, um, there's also that same card listed in pre-release, which if you want to consider that the same card, means we're looking at another five line items. So 15 line items for this, what you would consider, what you'd think of as a specific individual card and every single one of those on TCG player's end, and when you're pricing through TCG player's mass price or CSV upload has a unique line item with uniquely tracked lowest listing and market data, which can be incredibly positive. Mm -hmm. um, many, many people know, like if you've, if you've sold in TCG player for any amount of time, especially in magic, you'll know that pre-sale prices are way higher than one would expect. And 
weirdly less sold variants of cards, let's say a mod play foil of a card that's literally still in standard, is going to have a strange price attached to it. But being able to specifically look at all that data and being able to actually accurately price instead of only pricing off of a single data point, which is generally what we were doing in Crystal Commerce. We were looking at near mint, non-foil, and then it was percentages up or down for every line item off of that. And that only looking at one point of data like that can adversely affect your ability to price your inventory and to successfully create sales. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that jump for us was crazy. It was massive. We had to pre-schedule our employees. We didn't have enough people scheduled to ship orders. Um, and it was the beginning of the end of our arcane method of sorting inventory as we moved through additional products like that. Interesting, yeah. So um, it's going with inventory management solutions is something that uh, TCG Player has been really useful for to a lot of sellers. Um, and it sounds like in general, your experience with online sales has been a, an exercise in pivoting for uh, that sort of thing, right? Yeah, so I'm looking at the camera, <laughs> hi. Um, so, uh, yeah, as far as that goes, um, with the uh, inventory management and also staying on your feet, uh, do you have any like good suggestions for just being able to pivot quickly and you know stick with uh, your business's ability to adapt? Yeah, it's it can change on a dime, I suppose, especially mm -hmm. when you enroll in new products. And my 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 biggest recommendation is just to utilize the tools that you have. Um, you're going to have employees that are better in certain areas than in others. Um, you're going to have a CSM that you should contact whenever you have issues. Um, <laughs> yes. you, um, I, I recommend that you be flexible. Um, there are going to be changes that are going to look like they're going to be better, but will require a massive amount of investment. If that's time and energy, most likely, um, sometimes you really should consider like is it is it something that you really should do um and that's that's something i can't recommend enough something else is um as you scale uh especially in online sales sometimes you're going to need different hardware in order to be able to do what you're doing um there's many ways to ship orders um and a lot of people are using a variety of ways but some ways work at scale better than others um, when I very first started, I was printing out shipping labels on eight and a half by 11 printer paper, cutting them out and taping them to bubble mailers. Uh, that takes a lot of time. Yeah. And yes, a thermal printer is expensive and you have to do the research and find the one that's going to work with the software that you're using, but that time and money is well spent. I, I can't suggest it enough. Um, similarly, your inventory, you start with 500 cards. You need like a box. Uh, you get up to 100,000 cards and you're going to need many, many boxes, but not just many boxes, but ways to access them easily and quickly throughout the day. If you have customers coming in and they have orders and you want to be able to pull them on the spot or, you know, just generically, you have to ship orders many times a week and you don't want to, you know, spend more payroll than you have to on that. Your employees have things to do. Um, that's, that's a consideration as well. Some people have been very gracious and posted their layouts for some pictures of how they store their inventory on the pro page, mm -hmm. um, which has been fantastic. We recently invested almost $2,000 in shelving units specifically for holding TCG player card inventory. Like that's, that's what it does. It, <laughs> it's a big piece of wood and it holds cards, but it also increases our efficiency like a lot. Mm -hmm. There was, a picture that was there was a picture shared actually from TCG player at one point it was this little tiny box as part of a larger box that was highlighting the pick and pull team um and it had a, a photo of like a, a room with cards in it and people standing it on stools and just you know oh, row yeah. after row after row of pull out card drawers and we were like that that's that's how that needs to be 
so we have gotten a little bit of feedback from our Facebook chat really quick. Just going to hit some of that. Um, one of the questions from Facebook, you have been kind of hitting it on and off, which is just uh, how do you have your card inventory room organized? Which is um, so, uh, you know, you have the big shelves, right? But um, and you do you keep your TCG player inventory separate just in general for fulfilling online orders and or is it mixed together? Yeah. So uh, we are a pro member, but we mm -hmm. do not use in-store reserve at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so our entire inventory is live. Um, that And that includes our case. We have like stuff in glass cases because customers like to look at the pretty things. Mm -hmm. And that's live too. Um, and I know some people are get worried about that. Like, hey, what if a customer asks, you know, hey, I can't find this in your kiosk. And we're like, oh, it sold literally five minutes ago. That's happened, and that can be a negative interaction, but it can also be one of those things that can help drive urgency. You can, you can easily say to your customer, hey, when we do upload stuff or when we upload large amounts of stuff, we post on, say, Instagram or Facebook, and that's when you should check. Like, if you can let your customers know that, yeah, you're competing with the internet, um, it can also drive traffic. And that's not the route everyone wants to take. And that's right. perfectly valid. Um, I have used the in-store reserve system before. It is really cool. It does require a little more paperwork um, and maintenance, but it allows you to provide a really cool service to your customers if you'd like. Alternatively, you can just keep that inventory separate, but then you have to update the prices in a different way than the way you update your TCG player inventory. So part A, all of our inventory is together, except for the stuff that's in the cases. You have to remember to go check. Oh man, I can't find this volcanic island. It's probably in the case. Mm -hmm. Don't panic. Um, <laughs> but how is it actually stored? Um, we have it in rolling pullout shelves. Um, it's as vertically compact as we can possibly get it um, because the, the biggest thing is there's only so much, so many vertical feet in which employees are, can be comfortable working. Um, and a, a lot of employers prefer to have their boxes like pulled out and moved to a flat surface where um, they can work uh, and just pull the cars and put the box back. And that works great. But eventually you just have so many boxes that being able to vertically shrink the space required is just a huge benefit. Um, so we're using standing shelving units with rolling drawers that can support the weight of the boxes. We hold everything in BCW three rows. Um, and it's sorted exactly the same way that TCG players inventory is sorted with a couple of very specific adjustments. Um, sometimes we just don't have enough cards to justify certain distinctions. So for example, um, dual deck foils by condition. We don't have those separated by dual deck because there was like one card, two cards mm -hmm. per set. So we didn't separate those. We made one tab for dual deck and every single foil from dual deck in near mint, light play, mod play, heavy play, damaged foil are just together. Um, similarly, damaged foil is a tiny section because firstly, we don't like taking them in. It's mm. a damaged foil. Uh, <laughs> it's probably not gonna move. It probably doesn't have any market data. We probably can't even accurately price it. Um, so we just have that section alphabetized. It's like 50 cards. Like, Sometimes you just need to be able to find the card quickly. And so there's adjustments you can make that make that easier for you. Well, I feel like another trick that some people do um, if they don't have the, the deep inventory to be able to separate it like that is to use colored sleeves. So like all your near mint foils are like in a green sleeve or something like that, or have like a green spot dot on it <laughs> on the sleeve if you're using clear sleeves. Um, that's another uh, technique people use to be able to figure out like exactly like if they're not uh, like condition savvy if the people that are pulling the cards might not uh, be able to differentiate condition that's a nice way to make it easier on your employees um, that we've heard from other people yeah Megan that was actually a thing that we ran into lo long ago when we didn't have cards separated by condition we were sleeving every card and marking the condition on the sleeve um, in some way like it was at the time colored pen, um, which was the fastest way we could mark sleeves in large quantities. But you still had to sleeve every card. Yes, that's the, 
handle. That's a major downside, especially if you're shipping out via direct where you need to unsleeve everything that's under $25 and not a foil. Like it just, it just ends up not working out um, for time generally. Um, and we saved so many man hours as soon as we, we separated our, our conditions so that it's just like, nope, near mint is over there and light play is over there and mod play is over there. Um, we didn't need to sleeve those anymore. We didn't need to mark them in any way. They were just in the right box. Um, and that's, I think, something that gets overlooked sometimes when you talk about like separating by condition. Oh man, I'm gonna have to resort my entire inventory. It's gonna take me forever. It's like, yes, but you don't have to sleeve those cards anymore. Yeah, a lot of work in ahead of time and to have the, the ability to be able to pull quickly and efficiently down the line. Um, I think we get that um, kind of hesitation a lot when people are first joining pro. I don't know if you experience this as well, but the um, digitizing your entire inventory can be intimidating if you have a really deep inventory. Did you experience that kind of trepidation at all? Or were you like, okay, we're going to digitize all of this in one go? Oh, it was, it was terrifying. We, so we had, um, it, especially when we transferred from, from Crystal Commerce to TCG Player Pro, uh, we had zero faith in the accuracy of our inventory. Um, so we took an export of what we had. We did the CSV manipulation that was required. Um, we exported, it, it, was, there was, it was provided by TCG Player somewhere in, in the transfer. Here's your entire inventory. And we <clears throat> formed an inventory audit. We did the entire thing. Um, and there was a whole lot that had to get done. We had to massively edit that CSV clear our entire inventory and upload it back up once we knew that the data we had was accurate. Um, and that in and of itself was a massive undertaking. It was, we had to use two people just to make sure that we weren't missing things. We couldn't work longer than like four to six hours at a time because eventually you just can't anymore. I right. start spinning. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it was, it was time consuming for certain. Um, was it worth it? Oh my God. Yes. Just knowing is amazing. Um, and being able then to be able to track when things go missing or aren't being sort stored or sorted properly, you can figure out why you can actually see the trends. Um, you can keep better records. You can better train your employees. It's, it was so phenomenal. So I can't, I can't recommend that enough. For people who have to actually digitize it for the first time though, whew, that's a challenge I haven't had to deal with yet. Mm -hmm. so just stick with it, I, I promise it's worth it. <laughs> uh, yeah, as it relates to that also, uh, similarly, sellers will have to go through their inventory to double check uh, conditioning, for example, while they're trying to get an accurate inventory count. Uh, one of the things that I wanted to ask you about is, you have a staff, you know, you have more than one employee. Uh, how do you keep your employees on the same page of what your conditioning is? Oh man, okay, Sean, I'm so glad you asked me this because Oh, Eric's like tier one, and then you know everyone that he introduces me to is tier two. Sorry, Monica. Um, it hurts me. <laughs> that's fair. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, when we first joined Direct, uh, I we had the same reaction that many sellers do, which is, why are so many things getting bounced back? Um, and the answer is because we're not on the same page yet. Um, this is a facet of what makes TCG Player fantastic, is, which is that it's a marketplace. It is a living thing and it is made up of the phenomenal team at TCG Player and every seller on the platform. And together, we get to actually sculpt the magic world and all the other things that are sold here. But of course, we mostly do magic, so that's where I'm gonna talk from. Um, when we first went to Direct, we were getting a lot of things um, bounced back in our SDI that were, uh, were, were, you know, deemed not to be in the appropriate condition. And like anyone who is any seller that's first enrolled in direct, you're told, hey, on your first SEI, you can and should request a detailed feedback of why. Um, and we, we did. The first time SEI populated, we requested, hey, um, can we get some detailed feedback on these cards? And we got back 
a nice stack with Sharpies all over the sleeves with, and a detailed printout, this card, this is the condition it came in, this is the condition we graded it at, this is why, and then it was on the card. Um, so we could see it, which was amazing. We have now just physical examples of, hey, this is this condition and this is why. Take it over to the lamp, take a look at it, put the sleeve on, take the sleeve off. Um, and that became the baseline. Um, it wasn't just a phenomenal tool to train the employees. It was also a phenomenal tool to educate customers. Um, customers don't have a good baseline for what conditions are, except from their local shops and from much larger non-marketplace entities that don't necessarily use the same grading scale. Um, there are other freestanding entities that aren't on the marketplace that use strange grading co uh, conventions like very good or played. It's like, what does that mean? But we know, we know what that means. TCG Player has written it down for us and all the sellers can just get on board. It's just, this is exactly what it means for every condition and every foil condition. Um, that list actually got updated um, in the last six months or so to be more clear on exactly what can happen and how the conditions uh, work. But getting actual real feedback from um, the warehouse team was just phenomenal. Um, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, and that's, that's the, real, the real tool that we've been able to use. Like almost every tool is someone from TCG Player just walk us through it. Um, and I, I recommend to every seller to use those tools. The stronger the marketplace is, the more customers will trust the sellers on the platform. And the more customers trust every seller on the platform, the more we can succeed as individual sellers, as we pull customers away from giant freestanding companies and into our actual business. Um, which is, is absolutely phenomenal. And that's frequently something that we say is that uh, brick and mortar stores are the backbone of the industry uh, because you guys are, you're providing a place for people to play, you're providing a place for people to buy things, they can handle it, they can, you know, learn. And that's not just something we say, like you guys are, are on the front lines and, uh, and we're here to help and support. So if, and you know, it, communicate with your TCG player rep, communicate with TCG player. Um, we want to have the conversation. We want to get everybody on the same page and, and really work together to elevate the whole system. So mm -hmm. the industry and community, you, us and you and everybody. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dylan, I wanted to ask, uh, following that, uh, you know, uh, brick and mortar stores are the backbone of the industry um, and your bread and butter isn't just online sales so uh, let's talk about events for a little bit what uh, what what are some challenges that you've seen in hosting events what are events like at your location how do you get people in your store what's your favorite event to host what's your favorite event to host besides <laughs> birthday parties obviously silent discos <laughs> <laughs> no, no, all right. Good to know. Good tips for everyone out there who is uh, joining us through remote land. <laughs> um, but um, our, our, our best event is Commander. Um, it's hands down, Watsy should support it more, Commander. Um, and it moves a lot of our singles too. You can look at an order and you can kind of know where it's going. Some of it is just crazy kitchen table. Um, and some of it is modern and some of it is standard and a whole lot of it is commander. Um, and in store, that's what we do. We do commander like a lot. Our community here locally, we have a lot of stores in a very small area and every store has its own theme and its own focus. And that's phenomenal because it means that customers have choice and stores can focus on the things they want to focus on and customers can benefit from that specialization. Um, which is fantastic. Um, we pull in a full house for a commander, uh, which is super, but it means that we need to add another kiosk pretty quickly here. Um, we're currently only running on one kiosk and it can be slow. That's partially a hardware issue, 
Um, it could really use some more RAM, that poor little machine. Um, and sometimes there's a line and it's like, yeah, no, we really plan to add more kiosks. Those get used in store all the time. People are in the middle of a game. Someone gets up after their turn is over while some blue player is dinking around whatever on earth it is their deck does. Uh, and comes over and looks for some stuff in the kiosk and punches it through and goes back to their table. And, you know, we'll pull it and do they want it off their credit or, uh, you know, do they need to actually pay for it? And we just take it over to them. Like, it's great. It's a fantastic system. It works really, really well. Um, we do our, our next most popular event, but it's, it's pre-release. Everyone does pre-release and it's, one of my favorite formats um like limited sealed is just so cool but mm -hmm. also there's a whole lot of cards that come in like uh, firstly of course pre-release stamps pre-release stamps only come out from pre-release kits um and so we work hard to make sure that we actually have physical buy list printouts in store for that weekend like hey you crack this stuff we will buy it today this is how much for credit this is how much for cash um, and we're able to capture some of that on the day, which is, is fantastic. As I mentioned earlier, pre-sale volume, uh, pre-sale numbers are better for sellers. Um, and the customers that are interested in getting those cards in advance, um, which in, includes like buying on pre-sale weekend so that, you know, they can have it like the next week when release comes around, um, mm -hmm is majorly beneficial. It, it helps our local customers. They get some extra credit out of it. Maybe they want to, you know, pre-order another box for release day or they're going to get a bundle when release comes around. And all those customers that want to be able to pre-order on this marketplace can do so um, because we're able to, to have those events and bring in those cards locally, uh, which is, is absolutely phenomenal. It's, it's great for us. We also just love events. We could we couldn't do this without the local player base and we wouldn't at all because that's the only reason we're here. Like we love having a brick and mortar store. We love the interactions with the local customers. Um, you can make money other ways, but building a community is its own thing. Definitely. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, one question from uh, in-house how much is a full house like what's the size of your space what uh, what do you actually see at a full commander night sure so this this location that we've opened here is fairly new for us we opened this in god this year i guess it was january december um we fit in 40 people right now and we're adding in another 100 seats uh, as we're expanding into the next unit over um because it's just it's just not enough. We are last week we had the end of this this season's commander league and it was it was standing room, which was probably not up to code for, you know, the city's purposes. Um so we we want to make sure that we're able to support those customers and we want those larger events. We want and and there's other stores that are of course in much larger spaces that have, mm -hmm. you know, pre releases that are in the hundreds and are able to host MCQs and what have you. But you do not need to be that size to be successful on TCG Player. Um, it's, it's why we're here. We are here because we want the community. We are here because this is what we want to do with our lives. But the, the, the business part didn't require more than a fifth of our original footprint. Uh, one of the questions I have really quick following that, uh, getting back into fluff, uh, what was the commander deck that won the league? Who is the commander? Do you know? Oh, here we go. <laughs> uh, okay, so the league is, it's casual for long and e extended reasons that mostly revolve around some players like to have fun and some players have fun in a different way than those players. <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> um, and for that reason, our league is structured around a points-based system. It's casual. You decide who you want to play with so you can play with people that are around your same power level and like having fun the same way you do. Um, mm -hmm. And there's, there's points for doing the normal things. You, you beat players, you win pods, you, and then there's the weekly achievements and themes, and those are the, the actual interesting parts. Get points for your achievements, get points for completing the themes. That's all authored by uh, my business partner. When it's, a, it's a heinous amount of fun. Um, this league, at the end of eight weeks, we look at 
total points from all categories, and it was a tie for first Ooh. between two players. Um, one of them was was he playing uh, his silly banana deck? What's that guy's name? Asager. Ugh. Oh, okay. There's <laughs> a banana. Yeah. There's, there's a banana in the. It's an entire. Yeah. There's a banana in the yard, and so that's how we know it. Um, right. And then the other second, what were you playing this season? Um, I played a new oh, there's a winner. Oh, now. God. It was actually a new deck. It was the Commander 19 deck. Um, for since, since it came out, um, he's been playing that. And it was, it was Goad. It's just, it's just the Goad Commander. And <laughs> it just made everyone kill each other a lot. And right. that yeah. died heroically second to last. Um, but... You know, you come in every week, you get all the achievements, you get all the themes, and you rack up the points. <laughs> yeah. That's a really cool format. I like that. It, it actually wasn't our idea. Uh -huh. um, we had so many problems. Oh, for years, um, my, my business partner primarily ran Commander Leagues, um, and there have been so many problems so many times. Like, oh man, you can't win before turn X, or these cards are banned, or you can't combo more than six times or whatever and it just doesn't work you just have you're just incentivizing players to build around it because that's how they have fun those players have fun by doing different things um and so eventually we came to this idea that we had had was brought from a player actually it was part of the community said hey look at this thing that they're doing in chicago and we were like what i don't know he sent us a link and there was this really cool idea for a commander league we were just like that, but we're gonna do it this way, um, and that's that's where that came from. It was from inadvertent collaboration between stores by means of the local community. That's awesome. Yeah, and that's, that's amazing. It's so cool. Well, uh, we've been going at it for about forty minutes, no, fifty minutes now. So uh, let's start our outro. If anyone has any more questions or feedback, throw them in the chat. But um, before we go, just in general, uh, Dylan, thank you for joining us. Uh, what color do you play? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Sure. All right, cool. All right, so we've got that. Um, once again, Dylan, Dragon Parlor Games, thank you for joining us. Uh, we're going to be back for our more office hours next week. Uh, if you have any questions or feedback, uh, reach out to your CSM at sales at tcgplayer.com. Uh, I'm Sean with the onboarding team, Sean McNichol. And I'm Monica, customer success manager, not as good as Eric. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> oh, yeah, you heard that from Dylan first. <laughs> Woof. It's fine. All right. We learned from him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thanks. Um, and we'll see you soon. Thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Have a good night. All right. Have a nice day.